Camera works. <coughs> Live on Facebook. And camera appears to be recording. Hopefully it stays that way. Good morning, everybody. Uh, hopefully we'll see uh, Christine Freeland again soon. I'm, we're praying that uh, her situation gets uh, better. Do you like that always or just started? I'd love to have another woman solo, I'll tell you what. Um, there are nothing but awesome things to say about last weekend. I think everybody agrees that the trip to uh, Aspen was uh, the campground there was awesome. Pray for uh, I'm sorry that the message didn't uh, get fully recorded. Uh, so we all had like 25 minutes of what was a really good sermon, despite my my fatigue and, and forgetting things. Uh, it, the message should have been abundantly clear. We go through the gospel and then address uh, the nuances that are, are distinctly uh, in contradiction to the Bible. Well, I think we're all on the same page with that. So uh, after a short discussion uh, this morning, it looks like we are going shooting and, and uh, Brother Jake will let us know what time we're going to start that. Um, I'll make sure I have the pop-up and uh, water. Ice and water. Stoning the White Mountains, this is important, guys. On the 17th of August, uh, we're going to be starting very early. That's cool. Because it's a three hour drive. Okay? So, um, if we want to get started, at, you know, soloing between 9 30 and 10 a.m. On, on that Saturday morning, it's going to be a very, very early start. Now, uh, we'll have to discuss on where we're meeting, if it's going to be here or somewhere else, just to make convenience for uh, Brother Jake coming all the way from the east side. Uh, but we should con meet as early as 5.30. That's early, especially for early. most of you guys. Because um, we want to be on the road by 6 to get there around 9 and have breakfast together in prayer. So I want you to put in your calendar the 17th, which is a Saturday, and we're heading up to the White Mountains, and we're meeting at 5.30 a.m. Uh, we'll discuss the location uh, while we're so winning today. So at 9 a.m. we'll have breakfast. What I'll probably end up doing is packing us breakfast. I'll you know, uh, pack up the cool with some fruits, some breakfast sandwiches, uh, and then, of course, sandwiches for lunch. And then something uh, for the way home as well, because uh, we will sew in until noon and have lunch, and then uh, we can continue to sew in until uh, three or four, depending on how we feel. So three to four o'clock. So you have, we're going to have um, more than four hours, God willing, of soul winning. So you guys will actually have a tremendous amount of time to go through your gospel presentations and really get some good, good work done uh, in the White Mountains. Uh, they're extremely receptive and um, I'll likely end up driving everybody because it'll just be easy to take my car uh, and pile you in there. Um, dog treats. Mm -hmm. Bring the dog treats. Okay. Uh, that's the only concern that anybody should have is, is the res dogs. Uh, they can be, uh, for some people, they can be very difficult. So I'm excited about soul winning white mountains because, again, they're extremely receptive and you have many salvations and, God willing, you get enough time that they will listen to you. That's the most awesome part. Even if, even if, um, you end up having, you know, uh, someone that's that's a little sideways. You're going to still be able to get through your, your presentation, and I encourage you to take the time to go over each individual step in detail and get them engage them. Say, hey, do you understand what it means to admit you're a sinner? Do you understand these things? Take your time. That's all we're going to have is time. So let's let's make sure we are we are getting in the practice of being thorough. Uh, we will have to order invites soon. Um, that's something that uh, we'll have to talk about. Uh, I mentioned I got a reply from David Daniels uh, regarding the 
potential documentary, which it's on my heart to do, and, and I know that Brother Jake's very interested in doing it as well. Uh, basically dismantling and destroying all the uh, fake manuscripts where our modern perversions are coming from. So he's responded. We're going to talk some more. Uh, awesome. Virginia and I and my son went to the homeschooling conference yesterday, and it was pretty impressive. Uh, now obviously, there's certain things that we you know, didn't align with with some of these, the schooling when you open up their curriculum and they're utilizing the NASB and the uh, and KJV and so on. However, one of the things that, that stuck out in my mind, and I still have some of the material, the Mennonites produce a homeschooling uh, program. We're not using it because uh, <coughs> One of the things I opened up to was uh, the, the doctrine of lordship salvation. So we're not using it uh, for obvious reasons. Um, again, if you don't remember, I did a sermon on lordship salvation some time ago. Uh, I think it was covered in the Doctrines of Disgrace uh, sermon. Uh, lordship salvation, basically what it means is that in order for you to achieve and maintain your salvation, you have to submit to Christ. The, be uh, utterly obedient to him, uh, and that would be a works salvation. So we don't need to uh, cover that right now. Uh, you can visit that sermon at your leisure. But uh, the information that was in there, well, the reason why I want to share about the Mennonites is because if you want to talk about a level of, of modesty and dedication, uh, those people are on, on point. And if you want to, you know, reflect on, on where we ought to be going in our direction, their modesty is, is amazing. I absolutely love it. Uh, I don't, you know, recommend ladies, you know, have to wear those stupid little things on their head all the time. But dresses are fantastic. Uh, they look like women. There's no question about that. The other thing regarding their dedication is every one of the, the, these the, the models of curriculum that they have are geared towards Scripture. So there's like a ton of scripture in everything in their scholastics. And uh, you look at that and you, 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 you get ponder you know, the description memorization that is you know, required. Granted, the homeschooling program we're going to take for uh, our family is just that as well. Um, but they incorporate it in a greater detail. Uh, and uh, so they, there's a lot of commendation for the Mennonites in that regard. Unfortunately, their, their gospel is a little sideways uh, regarding works-based salvation. But I'm sure there's other things. I mean, there's no reason to, to get into a, a dissertation or a sermon just on that. But I wanted to make that a point because we ought to be looking towards becoming more modest in our behavior, in our dress, in our language. We ought to be as dedicated to God's Word uh, and uh, incorporate it specifically in our lives and uh, everything that we do. Uh, so we normally do a scripture reading because today's sermon is going to be preaching through Malachi and I'm not going to take the time to do that. Uh, oh, there's no need to do a scripture reading. Turn down the volume a little bit. Thank you. Um, and let's go ahead and get into prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this uh, time that we've had uh, over the past weekend uh, to fellowship and the wisdom of your word and the time away to be refreshed. Lord, we, we thank you for the, the ability to come before you and worship and study your word and have a fuller understanding of your heart. Lord, we ask for the healing of, of my mother once again. She's still suffering from various ailments. She cannot be with us today. Uh, we ask for the return of Christine Freeland. Uh, she has got a heart and zeal for this fellowship, and we would like to see her, especially uh, becoming a fruitful servant, to uh, be part of our soul winning as she's so desired. We pray that her house is, is abundantly provided for and that she can return. Uh, Lord, we pray for all the absent members that uh, they are, are uh, watching today and, and receive the message clearly. We pray for our peripheral friends that uh, love to uh, join in with us that they receive the message and are blessed by it. Lord, bless the soul winning. We pray this in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Malachi's ministry was around 430 B.C., so it was almost 500 years before Christ. Uh, 
he dealt with very much the same things as Ezra and Nehemiah. So there's a lot of uh, things that were uh, covered that are very similar. And of course, as you know, he's the last prophet of the Old Testament. God opens the entire book of Malachi with accusation, interrogation, refutation, and finally his conclusion. How many times throughout the Old Testament do we see God rejecting Israel? And literally, the Bible, the, 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 this book opens with the, the exact discussion, the exact circumstances that separate Jew from the Gentile. So, with our eyes open, uh, we'll see uh, more uh, strong words to the nation of Israel, and God is turning from them to us. Let's uh, start in Malachi 1, verse 1. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. Now, that is a powerful statement. It's a burden. What does that mean? Well, it's difficult. It's grievous. It's wearisome. It's oppressive. The message is oppressive because they want to be disobedient. And he's going to cover this. Verse 2. I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage to waste for the dragons of the wilderness, whereas Edom saith, We are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, They shall build, but I will throw down, and they shall call them the border of wickedness, and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. Not a little while, but forever. So this reference to Esau and Jacob we know from Romans as well. Uh, but it's referring to Genesis 25 and verse 23. The Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separate from their, thy bowels. And one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. In fact, if you reflect back to the book of Revelation... As we like to quote the synagogue of Satan in there uh, in Revelation 2 9 and 3 9, it specifically says that they will. Um, well, let's, let's actually read it so I don't misquote it. Come on now. Revelation chapter 2, verse 9. I know the works of tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. I know the blasphemy of them that would say they are Jews and are not, but are called the synagogue of Satan. 3.9 reads, Behold, I will make them the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. If there's any doubt, the elder will serve the younger. Those are the words of our Lord. So there's the doctrine of replacement theology again. It is, it is prevalent throughout the Old Testament, and it's the only the only reason why it's not visible is because you listen yeah. to the chatter of uh, false doctrines. Verse five: And your eyes shall see, and you shall say, The Lord will be magnified. Back to Malachi. I apologize. Uh, the Lord will be magnified from the board of Israel. A son honored his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priests that despise my name. To this day, they spit, and they say our Lord's name. And you see, wherein have we despised thy name? offer polluted bread unto mine altar. So they don't even care. They're, they're literally offering rotten, moldy bread. We're, we're not going to give God the best of us. We're going to keep that for ourselves and give Him the rotten food. And you say, where we have polluted thee, in, in, in that you say, the table of the Lord is contemptible. Now he's taking it from the physical to the spiritual. And if you order the blind sacrifice, is it not evil? And if you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now to thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee? 
with thee, or uh, or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts. So, is, is anybody else going to accept this rotten offering? Is anybody else going to accept this this heart that is against him? The, the prayers, the any any work that is is genuine is going to be of the heart, and they are lacking there. And now I pray you beseech God that He will be gracious unto us. This has been by your means. Will He regard your person? Say the Lord of hosts. Who is there even among you that would shut the doors for naught? Neither do ye kindle fire of mine altar for naught. I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts, neither will I accept an offering at your hand. Replacement theology. For from the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles, they are replaced, and I have ever pla every place incense shall be offered unto my name, and, I, uh, and a pure offering. For my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye have profaned it, that ye say the table of the Lord is polluted, and the fruit thereof, even his meat, is contemptible. You said also, Behold, what a weariness it is, and ye have snuffed at it, saith the Lord of hosts. So God's given them everything they need, and he, they just... Yeah. It's, it's manna. Where's my steak? We ought to be grateful for every thing that's given to from our Lord. And we He uses all of this in the Old Testament for our benefit. This is why it's called our schoolmaster. This is why we ought to learn from this. We ought to spend our time in studying and understanding the Old Testament so that we don't replicate some of the same behavior of snuffing at the Lord's blessings. Amen. And you brought that which was torn and lame and, and the sick, thus you brought an offering. Should I accept this of your hand, saith the Lord? But cursed be the deceiver which hath in his flock a male and voweth and sacrifice unto the Lord a corrupt thing. So again, instead of giving what is right and just unto the Lord, they give him the scraps. For I am great king, a great king, saith the Lord of hosts, and my name is dreadful among the heathen. Now that's a powerful statement, and most people don't get it. They don't understand the dread and the fear, unless they are truly saved. Do we not rejoice in our terrible God? Our God is a terrible God. He is to be feared. It is when you lack that fear, you, you end up uh, backsliding. Nehemiah calls him this. Let's turn to, to Psalm 66. Keep your finger in Malachi. Oh, no. Psalm chapter 66. One of my favorite passages. We're going to read 3 through 5 in Psalm 66. Psalm chapter 66, verse 3. Say unto God, How terrible art thou in thy works! Through the greatness of thy power shall thine enemies submit themselves unto thee. All the earth shall worship thee and sing unto thee. They shall sing to thy name, Selah. Come and see the works of God. He is terrible in His doing toward the children of men. Just like any parent, we ought to have a natural fear. And this is what it means to be terrible. If my son doesn't have a natural fear of my voice when I, I, I raise it towards him, there's a problem. This is what happens to, to these people, and it, well, it's it's common amongst many. We have this milk toast Christian view, uh, this evangelical view that God is this, you know, soft, squishy, 
loving, graceful God. Well, in fact, this morning when I was writing that horrific paper, they discuss in this book that we spend too much time expressing the wrath and hell in our gospel presentation. Really? So, we, we, we spend too much time emphasizing the wages of sin or death? Okay, so let us get back to a base sense of our humanity. When you're hungry, doesn't your stomach hurt? You cannot understand unless you feel some kind of pain. And, and the reality is you're not going to hell, but you need to understand the pain and suffering of it and express that. The idea that you should downplay, again, this is literally from the book I just read, um, The Gospel of King Jesus, I think that's what it was called. Um, but it's atrocious. It, it, it's nothing but you know discussing the, the works of John Piper and uh, Moody and uh, Billy Sunday, even Billy Graham's in there. Come on, these, most of these guys are in hell. They never made it. And this is what you have to contend with. So they have, they have, they have taken the, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ and understanding that we have earned our way to hell and they replace it with this soft, mushy version of love and relationship. I do not deny the relationship, but I also do not overemphasize it. I do not shy away from God's wrath. I do find it terrible and fearsome. He wiped out the entire world, folks. The entire world was covered in water. And that was righteous. So should we ignore the wrath? Not hardly. But we should emphasize it. God is terrible. Chapter 2. And now, ye priests, this commandment is for you. If you will not hear, and if you will not lay it to your heart to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings, yea, I have cursed them already, because ye do not lay it in your heart. So their priests are not studying the word, the priests are not committing God's word to their heart. Behold, I will corrupt your seed and spread dung upon your faces, even the dung of the solemn beast, and shall take you away with it. How much shame does God have to depict in one verse? That is horrific shame to spread dung upon somebody's face. This is, when, when you have that much indignation, We ought to be paying attention. What is it that is, is, is making God so vindictive towards these priests? They're, they're following doctrines of men. Christ even said that they were. And this has not been going on in just in the New Testament. It's going back into the Old Testament that they were following doctrines of men. They did not commit God's word and his name to their hearts. Behold, I will corrupt your seed and spread dung upon your faces. I apologize. Uh, if you will know that I have sent the commandment unto you, that my covenant might be with Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him of the life and peace, and I gave them for him the fear wherewith he feared me, and was afraid before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth, and the in iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity and did turn away many away from iniquity. For the priest's lips should keep knowledge and they should seek the law at his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. What they fail to realize is that the position given to them and pastors to this day still are in this, this, this haze of glorifying themselves, the position that's given to them is a humbling position. Being a messenger does not mean that you live a lofty life. Being a messenger means that oftentimes you will be martyred, whether it be through uh, social aspects of our world or physically martyred, which will happen in due time. So they've raised themselves up. 
They have ignored God. They have abandoned the message. And we ought to be converting people. But you have departed out of the way. You have caused many to stumble at the law. We see this all the time today. People have rejected the Old Testament. We're a, we're, we're a New Covenant church. We just read the New Testament. I did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. Pastors to this day are still in this, this boat, and I see it constantly. I hear it constantly. How many churches in the valley go soul winning? You can count them on one hand. How many churches in Arizona go soul winning? You can count them on one hand. You can do that in every state of this nation. The freest country to preach the gospel, and you can count on every uh, in every state on one hand how many go soul winning. The Great Commission is not considered great. However, this discipleship nonsense has gotten out of hand. And why? Because the false Bible say it. Go ye therefore and make disciples. Well, so you want me to do the Holy Ghost job? That's not my job. My job was told to go and plant and water. He never told me anywhere in this Bible to disciple. Now, yes, we do minister, but the idea and concept of discipleship in this world has to do with pretty much begging people to come to church. And I'm not saying it's directed to anybody here in this, this, this church house. What I'm saying is this is what I've learned just from this morning. From the reading I just read this morning. The paper I had to write about this book review. Discipleship, as it is written in your modern Bibles, is false. You get your understanding, and all things are brought into remembrance by me, by you, or by the Holy Ghost. I can go on and on and on about how this example of the priest is happening right now. Therefore, I have also made you contemptible and base before all my people, all the people, excuse me, and according as you have not kept my ways, but you have been partial in the law. Some of it's good. We still do this day. Some of it's good. Yeah. Some of it's all right. Yeah. Are we to love the law? We are to love God's law. Well, you're a legalist. You know, I grew up in a legalist church. I know exactly what that is. They have no love of God's law. They have love of making themselves look grand. They are whitewashed sepulchers. Their mouths are filled with dead men's bones. Have we not all one Father? Amen. Have not one God created us? Amen. Why do we deal treacherously even every, every man against his brother? By profaning the covenant of our fathers. Now this is common. And, and uh, it's a sad state, but, but uh, dealing treacherously, railing against brothers is, is very common these days. Profaning the covenant. The covenant has always been and always has, always will be by faith through grace. It's never changed. Grace has always been there from the beginning. It's not new. What's new is the sacrifice. What's new is God becoming flesh and taking the sin debt for us. Judah hath dealt treacherously 
and an abomination is committed in Israel. Take a minute, and I wanted to point out something about these people. I discovered this not too long ago, maybe a couple months ago, and I think I brought up a conversation with one of y'all. The byword. Israel has become the byword. And thou shalt become an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword among all nations, whether the Lord shall leave thee. This is going back to Deuteronomy 28, verse 37. Then will I cut off Israel out of the land which I have given them in this house which I have hallowed for my name, and I cast out of my sight, and Israel shall be a proverb and a byword among all people. 1 Kings 9, 7. What a powerful statement to be a byword. Then will I pluck them up by the roots out of my land, tearing them out like a weed which I have given them in this house which I have sanctified for my name and I cast out of my sight and I will make it to be a proverb and a byword among all nations. 2 Corinthians 7.20 How do we get this misconstrued that they are God's chosen people when he's clearly saying he's ripping them out? like a weed. Thou makest us a byword among heathen and shaken the head among people. Psalm 44, 14. This is David talking about Israel. Made them a byword. Um, moving on. The Lord will cut off the man that doeth this, the master, uh, the scholar, out of the tabernacles of Jacob. And offer an offering to the Lord of hosts. And this have ye done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping, and with crying out, insomuch that he regardeth not the offering any more, or receiveth it with good will at your hand. <clears throat> they are literally crying and weeping. Okay, again, it's not of the heart. It's it's it basically, you know, just a woe is me thing, which Christ talks about. <clears throat> and he doesn't even receive it. Yet you say, Wherefore, because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, and it is she that a companion and the wife of thy covenant. So now there's spiritual implications regarding marriage, and in this case we're talking about divorce because that's what they were doing. The destruction of family started back in biblical times. Back, this has been going on from the time that Abraham went in with uh, Hagar. The destruction of biblical marriage has been going on. God holds the covenant of family in high regard. This is why the world is completely the opposite. Why are you bringing kids into the world? What do you mean, why? They're wonderful. They're a blessing. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full. God is the author of family. Father, Son, Spirit, family. That love existed before the foundation of the world. Before time. And he wanted to share that graciously with us. The Father of us all, all those who call upon his name. You know, I, on the way to go pick up Rick this morning, I was um, listening to that Zionist radio station, and I forget the name of the preacher, if you will, who was talking. And he was talking about everybody being God's children. I mean, the Bible speaks very differently about that. In fact, if you're not chastised by him, then you're a bastard. Not sons. So divorce has become common. It, it just, this is what this next uh, this passage regarding uh, dealing treacherously is talking about. This covenant, this promise from a man.
to a woman and the wife to the husband and unto God. Marriage is, is, is just eh, a piece of paper these days. That's how people feel about it. That's all it is. You know, it's either that's that that scenario or you absolutely have to have this paper. What happens at a covenant? What happens at a promise is made between a man and a woman and God? Does he not look at her spirit? As opposed to the letter? Our heart? So marriage has been dismantled. Marriage has been destroyed. Marriages and divorce have become commonplace. In fact, uh, it is... What's that expression about tattoos and divorce? It's... Uh, Once you get married, it's less permanent. And that's, you know, that's the way people think these days. Verse 15. And did not he make one? Yet had he the residue of the Spirit, and wherefore one? That he might seek a godly seed, therefore he, he take heed to your spirit. Answers in scriptures. And let none deal treacherously against the wife of, of the, his youth. For the Lord, of, uh, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. For one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit that ye deal not treacherously. Husbands ought to love their wives as Christ loves the church and give himself for her. Ephesians 2 20. God hates divorce. In fact, we, we are told we are not allowed to put aside our spouse. There's only one reason to do so for fornication. Now, I want to make sure that something is very clear to you as a newborn Christian, how God sees you, and you should not let any man confront you on your sins of your past prior to your salvation. The Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. 2 Corinthians 5.17 <laughs> when a brother confesses in me who they were prior to their salvation, I take that as, as, as wonderful because I know who they are now. God has changed them, created a new creation. I don't judge them by their past because they're not that person. That person's dead, buried with, in the water, and rose again with Christ. We are to judge. That's not something that we should we should shy away from. We should judge rightly. But when, in our in our daily Christian lives with our brothers, we ought to be compassionate and charitable regarding how we re rebuke one another. And that is who you are now, not the person you were. If somebody's going to drag up my past and rebuke me for it, I'm going to laugh. My God is not rebuking me for my past because that's not who I am anymore. Amen. In fact, the Bible says He literally puts it in His shadow behind Him. Is it necessary that we, we, we bring up things of the past? So, um, if you at one point got a divorce, I don't people in this, this room have, that does not reflect upon who you are now. Because you are now a new creation. Amen? Amen. Amen. You have wearied the Lord with your words. Did ye say wherein we are weary him? When ye say, Every one that, that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delighteth in them, or where is the God of judgment? So, again, they are spewing this stuff to God in their daily lives and questioning him. Boldly. What gall? What gall? Now, chapter 3, 
Chapter 3 is, is a, is a uh, chapter uh, addressing wickedness of the Jews. However, God's message to all of us, not just here, but all Scripture, uh, is very important. We ought to pay attention to it. So, what the chapter is about is primarily uh, tithes and tithing. Uh, and it's become a disdain amongst many. In fact, people have rejected it at this point. It's, and the reason why is because it's become an image of greed and evil. You have, you know, Seth Rodollar telling his church that he needs a new jet plane, or <laughs> Kenneth Copeland. <coughs> Sister Cindy Desilets was a part of a, a really wicked church, and, and the, the pastor gets up there and he starts talking about his headache, and discussion he had with his wife, and, oh, by the way, before the end of the service, we need to come up with $15,000. And oh, what a punk! She got up and walked out. Amen. It was Hillsong. Oh. The only reason why she was there again is because the the place that she was at required her to be a part of that house. But uh, she is vehemently opposed to everything that uh, Hillsong is and stands for. But my met, my point was is that these pastors are given to filthy lucre. And consequently, in order to, to maintain their status or grow in their status, they have to fill seats by corrupting the gospel. Filling seats means get more tithes, more offerings. <coughs> so Scripture can take that out of context, ignored and condemned. Uh, my only desire here is to give you what it says. Okay? I grew up in a church that held the Old Testament concept of tithing, in many cases, uh, into poverty and hardship. Yes, they tithe us into poverty and hardship. I've heard that the, the, the way the Mormons are able to pop up churches everywhere and build massive temples is through direct deposit. Of course, the more you pay in, the better chance you get in your own planet where you can become a god. Indulgences and offerings of the Roman Catholic Church is said to be living your faith while their net worth is in trillions. Joel Osteen owns 15k square foot home. Seth Rodollar requires the church to buy a uh, plane. Copeland as well, 760 million dollars and calls himself a Protestant. T.D. Jakes uh, is right behind him at 150 million dollars. I showed my wife for the first time T.D. Jakes preaching, and it, it was not an edited video, it was just him repeating the word, wake up. And it was a joke because they called it, you know, the T.D. Jakes alarm clock, and she couldn't believe that people <laughs> listened to this. <laughs> the word tithe, folks, has not changed. If we were, uh, if we... If we have, we give. That's a reality. If you don't have, what's there to give? We're going to talk about that. As we therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them that are the household of faith, Galatians 6.10. So when it comes to the offerings and tithes, it's to take care of this house. You, if you're in a pinch and something's going on in your life and you're, you're, you're in desperation, you ought to be coming to the church for help. The word tithe means the tenth, uh, uh, either money or goods or service. So if you think you don't have anything to give, I'll help you with that. There's plenty that you can do. It is a noun. It's a tenth part of anything, but appropriately the tenth part of the increase annually arising from the profits of land and stock allotted to the clergy for their support. Ties are, are personal, freenial, mixed, personal, when they are accruing from labor, art, trade, navigation, radial. This is just a definition out of the what Noah Webster. Okay? Yes, it is meant to support clergy, but let's let's be real. 
Paul was a tent maker for a reason. At tr plant, church planting, you have to be bivocational. This idea that you know ascending church has to support the pastor is not biblical. If I send out a brother to go plant a church, he should be still working a regular secular job. When a church grows to that point where they can sustain a pastor, by all means, that's a blessing from God. Every good thing comes from heaven. $760 million for Babylon. There are over 40 verses on tithing from the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Tithing never went away. The concept of being fulfilled is just simple. Being fulfilled is simply a lie. Nowhere does it say Christ fulfilled the law of tithing. In fact, we're going to discuss what it says, what Christ says about tithing in this sermon. Um, the entire Mosaic law is not cast out the window. I uh, think not that I've come to destroy the law and the prophets, but I've come, uh, I have not come to destroy but to fulfill. In the New Testament, you will see exactly which laws were fulfilled and which were we are uh, which are still observed or changed under the new and better covenant. Obviously, nobody's sacrificing any cows, goats, lambs, bullocks, anything like that, because Christ became that lamb for us. Yes. Cool. Go have a seat, buddy. Thank you. Tithing was first mentioned in Genesis 14.20. And it was from the heart, as all your offerings are supposed to be. The reason why I'm taking time on this is because it's a bone of contention with me growing up in that church where we had three tithes. Mm. <laughs> Passes driving nice cars and living in nice houses and gross. Herbert W. Armstrong flying around in his own personal jet. Can I borrow it? So it was a 10% of the spoil that he had given, and it was a free will offering. There's that expression, free will. Because you have it, it is a gift from God. And you should use it. Turn with me to Deuteronomy 26. Keep your thumb in, in, in Malachi. We're going to uh, go through uh, chapter 3 and 4. But we want to go to Deuteronomy chapter 26. Deuteronomy chapter 26 and verse 12. Verse 12. When thou hast made an end of tithing, all the tithes of thine increase, the third year, which is the year of tithing, and hast given it unto the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and they may eat within thy gates and be filled. So what is tithing for? Sounds like it's to help people, not make the pastor fat. Sorry, John Hagee. Well, not sorry. Not at all. He is a fat preacher. He calls himself a rabbi. Rabbi, right? yeah. yes. rabbi huh? The Kolwe grew up and taxed its members to death. And they still do to this day, although they're under a new name. This is why I'm, uh, so many are vehement uh, against tithing. I want you to see what tithing is. A stranger, someone who visits. If someone comes from abroad to your church, we should offer to put them up while they sojourn. That is a form of tithing. It's an offering. The fatherless, unwed, or widows of our church in need should be helped. If any are in despair, this is why the storehouse needs to be full. This whole premise, this is God, we're going to discuss this, is actually going to be God's words. The storehouse should be full. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the Word, and they that dwell therein, Psalm 24, 1. It is all His. Everything you think you own, it's God. He's a store. 
caretakers. We are caretakers. Every good gift, again, as I said, uh, every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, no change, neither shadow of turning. One seventeen. We are so blessed in this nation, even as wicked as it is. So, being charitable both inside and out of the church, is important. Now I want to give a proper biblical <coughs> exegesis, if you want to use that term, uh, just simply an explanation of Malachi 3. Growing up in a tithing machine, uh, you cling to those words, filthy lucre. I despise it. I hate the idea that men will corrupt the gospel for money. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, I will send my messenger. It's the title of today's message. And of course, this is talking about John the Baptist. Uh, although Malachi's name means my messenger. And you can draw multiple significance out of that. I wouldn't spend too much time in that consideration. But uh, know that it is God. It belongs to Him. John the Baptist belongs to him. And he shall prepare the way before me, uh, the Lord, whom ye seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight, and behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. So, John the Baptist, whom we get our namesake from being Baptist. Verse 2, but who may abide the day of His coming, and who shall stand when He appeareth? For He is like a refiner's fire, full of, like fuller's soap. And He shall sit as a refiner, purifier of silver, and He shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, and they may offer unto the Lord an offering of righteousness. So John the Baptist was a, a fiery preacher. And he rebuked, as we know, referring to the Sadducees and the Pharisees as vipers. All those who will be true ministers of the Word shall be placed in the furnace. This judgment and refining is necessary for the Word to be given only as He intends. Many will come in His name. I don't know a single person who is a genuine pastor didn't go through this fiery furnace and contend with our own wicked flesh and sins and the Lord constantly reminding us to keep us humble. Verse 4. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord in the days of the old and, and as in former years I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, and against the adulterers, and against the false swearers, and against those who oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow, and the fatherless, and turn aside the stranger from his right, and fear not me, saith the Lord. Christ rebuked Sadducees and Pharisees for tithing cumin and anise. How is that a necessity for the storehouse? It's a seasoning. And, and it's, it's not even a seasoning that is absolutely required. If they had brought wheat or some kind of grain to the storehouse, that could affect people. But they brought human and anise. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe and mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Matthew 23, 23. Christ admonishes them. Their tithing was a joke. And it, 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 their offering is, is not received. God was, is... <laughs> Spend some time in the book of Amos. 
He, he, he expresses such disdain for everything, including their prayers. Verse 5. Uh, verse 6, excuse me. For I am the Lord, I change not, therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Turn with me a minute to uh, Mark. Keep your finger there. We're going to get through this. Mark chapter 12. I want to spend some time in this because you need to understand how Christ views tithing. This is a great example. Mark 12, verse 41. And I've heard it preached before and completely wrong. I've heard it preached before and half the message was received. Or at least portrayed, excuse me. Verse 41, And Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury, and many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples, and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast into their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all of her living. The first thing we need to know is that Christ is observing this. Okay? Our offerings should be visible, even the fruit thereof. So if you are uh, giving of yourself and your time, the fruit thereof should be visible. In the case of boasting, however, should we, we should not be rejoicing uh, and we should be rejoicing what God has done for us. Uh, we mean rejoicing in ourselves. Two very small copper coins. Christ admonishes the disciples for their pride in uh, the mirroring uh, verses. The widow didn't tithe. What is a tithe? 10% of whatever. Earnings. Products, service. She gave it all. Why did the widow give it all? Why did the most wealthy put in a portion? The widow gave it all. Now I I've I have people that I know that believe that this is actually what Christ meant when he talked about bearing your cross that you should give up everything oh. and live the life of a pauper. Now um, <laughs> good night. Yeah, this is not the text, however, I believe. Uh, she was full of the Spirit. She knew where those two bits came from. And there's much more to come. She didn't worry about tomorrow. I got two bits. Here. Somebody else might need it. God will provide for me. She understood what tithing was for. So in the event that she didn't have she knew in her heart that she should go to the church to get help. In the book of Acts, I'm going to go ahead and read this for you. You don't have to go there. I have you jumping around quite a bit. Acts chapter 2, it talks about people just like that. However, what is not seen in Acts chapter 2 is, is them living like foolish paupers. 37. Verse, chapter 2, verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. The promise has great value, more so than possessions. And with many other words did they testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this un untoward generation. Then they gladly received the word, were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. 
and they continued steadfastly in, in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and breaking in bread and in prayers, which is absolutely wonderful, folks. Uh, I'm, I'm glad I had the opportunity to spend that type of time with my brothers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles, and, and all that believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and 